Chapter 8. Cold Reception Corn emerges from the woods of the Forlorn near the Ice Tribe village. However, the freezing winds complicate matters. Hmm. Yes. Well... Uh, whoa! What? Uh! Yes. Huh? Everything will be fine. Yes. So, Corn and Silas are left with only each other while the rest of the team goes elsewhere. This is what's called gameplay story integration. No way. Ugh. You. It's over. <gasps> Welcome. Thank you. out there. Yeah.
If you'll excuse me. Huh? It can't be. I... No. You know it. No! Horn and Elise have proven one thing, they have no guile whatsoever. Now we have to defeat Kilma in combat. He has retreated to his castle, house, manor, on the far side of the village. Kilma is a sorcerer, one of two possible promotions for dark mages, and the only promotion that retains the ability to use dark magic. He has the two standard dark mage skills, both of which are auras. The first one is Heartseeker, which reduces the avoid stat of adjacent enemies. And the second is the level 10 skill, Malefic Aura, which makes nearby foes take extra damage from all magical attacks. In our hands, these skills are pretty nice because they're unselfish. On a stationary boss, they're not much different from simply having higher magic and skill. Kilma's weapon is Nosferatu, the only dark tome in Fates. Dark magic traditionally has special effects. For Nosferatu, that effect is that it steals HP, converting 50% of its damage into health for the user. This tome got heavily nerfed in this game after being ridiculously overpowered in Awakening, but even after the nerf, the lifesteal effect remains very strong. It's especially strong when you have Vantage, a skill that makes the wielder strike first in combat if their HP is at 50% or less. If you wound Kilma badly in one round of combat, and then try to attack him again, he's going to preempt your attack thanks to Vantage. He'll try to hit you with Nosferatu, and if he succeeds, he'll restore some HP. That may allow him to survive your attack. Conversely, if you're not hitting Kilma hard and therefore not activating Vantage, he can count on Nosferatu to erase most or all of your chip damage. So this combination makes Kilma a tough opponent, in theory anyway. Aside from his magic, Kilma's stats are not actually all that impressive, and his speed is especially bad. It's fairly easy to double him, and if you can deal 15 damage with each hit on enemy phase, you can circumvent Vantage and Nosferatu entirely. As soon as we defeat Kilma, the mission will end. We want to get all the experience we possibly can, so we'll have to save him for last. In the meantime, our side objective is to visit the villages around the map. There are two in the southwest, one right by our starting position in the southeast, and another two in the northeast. If we go to at least three out of five, we will receive the maximum reward of 10,000 gold. We are opposed by lancers who will go to each village and rally the militias there. These lancers only have three movements, so they take a while to get around, but that's still fast enough to cause significant time pressure. We'll need to move quickly to intercept them. The Lancer who starts near Kilma will go down the west side of the map to visit the two villages over there, the first on turn 4 and the second on turn 7. On the opposite shore, closer to us, there's a second Lancer. He's already in range of one village, which he will visit immediately. He will then turn around and head to the northernmost village, reaching it on turn 5. The only village that's basically free is the one right by our starting position. The others will require some work. Aside from the Lancers, we're mainly facing a mixture of Dark Mages and Fighters, but there is one other obstacle, Flora. 
Flora is a maid just like Felicia, albeit with significantly more strength. Her combat abilities are not the problem, though. What makes her annoying is that she is our first opponent who uses an offensive staff. Hers is Freeze, the same one Elise had in Chapter 6 and Chapter 7. The threat of getting frozen makes it even harder to outrun the Lancer as we race to these western villages. And if you're not careful, a frozen unit can get caught out of position and killed. The trick to neutralize Flora's freeze staff is to let her use her dagger instead. If you give them the opportunity to choose, enemies always prefer to deal damage rather than use offensive staves. All we have to do is park someone within two spaces of Flora, and then the freeze threat is gone. One tool at our disposal is the pair of dragon veins on either side of the lake in the center of the map. When activated, these dragon veins temporarily melt that lake, turning it all into water tiles that are impassable for most classes. The way that works is that once the ice is melted, the enemies cannot move on to it, but the ones who are already on the lake tiles are simply trapped in place. So what we can do is move our whole team onto the lake and then melt it. That way we get a giant safe zone that no enemies can reach, and on the following turn when the lake refreezes, we can continue on our way. Right now, our team is about the same as it was when we left off. Korn and Felicia have the exact same equipment. Effie swapped lances with Silas, using the bronze lance for its higher accuracy. Arthur's carrying the concoction we received back in Chapter 4. He'll need it. We've given Silas a speed tonic. He's the one who's going to battle Kilma. Because Kilma has 7 speed, Silas needs 12 to double him. Silas has 9 speed naturally, and Korn or Arthur can give him 2 more, but that leaves him 1 point short without the tonic. Silas is carrying his iron sword and Effie's iron lance, which he can now use with his deranking lances. But he's also carrying several other items, a bronze bow, a vulnerary, and a fire tome. He's carrying these on behalf of our new recruits, who can use the E-rank weapons as more accurate alternatives to their initial armaments. We're putting Silas in the southwesternmost position so that he can ride as far as possible toward Flora on turn 1. Lastly, here's Elise. We've given her an HP tonic and a strength tonic, and she's no longer equipped with any staves. Instead, she's carrying an axe and a heart seal. She has all those things because she's not going to remain a troubadour any longer. Although Elise is perfectly serviceable as a healer, pure staff support is not a very productive role. When you're staff locked, the only thing you can do on most turns is heal somebody. But there are going to be lots of turns where no one really needs the healing, and staves cost money, so we don't want to use them up if we don't have to. This means that if Elise stays a troubadour, she will have a lot of dead turns. By becoming a wyvern rider, Elise gains the ability to attack on player phase and counterattack on enemy phase. As a result, her own action economy immediately becomes a lot better. Thanks to the innate stats of the Wyvern Rider class, Elise's combat abilities become perfectly respectable. With a base of 10, her defense is actually better than Arthur's. 9 speed is also a really good place to start, considering Elise's high speed growth. 8 innate strength is nothing to write home about, but 1 measly level will unlock the first Wyvern Rider skill, which is strength plus 2. She'll be guaranteed at least 10 strength almost immediately. Putting all that together, Elise makes for a fast flyer with solid defense, but low strength. Between pair-up, tonics, meals, and forging, Fates gives us lots and lots of ways to rectify low strength. The most important reason to change Elise's class is that doing so unlocks the full potential of her personal skill. Now that she can take a hit or two, Elise can afford to take forward positions. That flexibility allows other units to exploit Lily's poise much more often on both player phase and enemy phase. And that's a big deal, especially in the context of this challenge. The bonuses from Lily's poise make tag team setups much more viable, and tag team combat is our most efficient way to get experience, support points, and weapon training. Having said all that, Elise does have a real weakness, accuracy. Her skill stat is very bad, and axes have low natural hit. But even in this regard, Elise kind of lucks out. Axes have pretty good matchups in Conquest. In fact, the only early map with a significant population of sword or tome enemies is this one. So this map will be a rough start, but once we're done here, it'll be much smoother sailing. Also, several characters can boost Elise's accuracy, particularly Arthur, Corin, and two of our upcoming recruits. And we're starting her axe training early, so Elise will earn the accuracy bonuses that come with higher axe ranks fairly quickly. 
Our plan for this mission is to secure the three southernmost villages. We'll exploit the dragon mains to cross the lake safely, and the high mobility of Silas and Elise will help us reach the westernmost village on turn 4, right before the Lancer gets there. This means we're giving up the two villages in the northeast. A bunch of reinforcements will pour out of them both, and they'll immediately try to swarm us. If we allow them to do so, we are going to have serious problems, especially because this challenge requires us to keep firm control of our support point distribution, and if we're ever on the back foot, we're going to lose that. So what I have devised is a strategy wherein, after we reach the western villages, we will turn to meet those reinforcements and actively go through them, rather than playing it safe with a fighting retreat. By doing that, we can force the enemies to always move in the exact same ways every time, and we can always take the exact same actions to beat them. The downside is that we'll have to use several axe and bow dual strikes against mages. Those are going to be inaccurate, and unfortunately, most of them are essential. But because we have a winning sequence of moves that is known ahead of time, it's easy to try again if something goes wrong. Careful out there! Corin joins Elise. Like Silas, she can use her 7 movement range to cover a lot of ground immediately. Effie visits the village. Next turn, she'll be able to pair up with Felicia, who can then bring her over to rejoin the rest of the team. We can do this together. Arthur will drop Silas to the left. By putting our units here, we're occupying some spawn points for the two characters who are about to join us, so one of them will start farther west than normal. That works to our advantage. He'll be able to get to a better position than he otherwise could. This is definitely one of those cases where it's helpful to have some foreknowledge about the map, but even knowing where our two recruits show up, I don't think it ever would have occurred to me to manipulate their starting positions if I hadn't seen someone else do it first. The darkness whispers! <sighs> I am Odin Dark! Yes. Huh? Whoa, whoa! So sorry. As you wish. Okay. Thank you. Odin is the first of three characters returning from Awakening. This is Lissa's son Owain in disguise. He's a very fun character, and as a unit, he's pretty interesting. 
At first glance, he's not that impressive. He's a bit underleveled, and his main offensive stats, magic and speed, are nothing special. He has generally high growths, but a lot of those are allocated to skill and luck, which are not traditionally considered high impact stats. Don't be fooled by first impressions, though. For a mage, Odin has very good HP and defense, stats that always matter more when your class has the innate ability to counterattack almost anyone. Accordingly, he wants to become an enemy phase tank. He's only missing one ingredient, Nosferatu. That's the tome Kilna has, and we can buy it in the level 1 armory. We just couldn't afford it yet. Nosferatu has excellent might, especially given that it only requires D rank in tomes, but it cannot double, it cannot crit, and it has low accuracy. The accuracy matters a lot because it can only steal HP if it hits. That's where Odin's great skill and luck stats come in. He is by far the most accurate, natural dark mage in the game. So what Odin does is this. He takes Nosferatu, he grabs a support partner who can improve his defenses, and then he walks around eating up enemies, killing them in two rounds each and sustaining himself using Nosferatu's lifesteal effect. And that works for a good long while, with no other special attention required. Odin's personal skill is one of the funniest and most appropriate in the whole game. It grants him a higher chance to crit when he's wielding a forged weapon that has been given a very long name. As with Arthur, it can be really entertaining to have him pursue a dedicated crit build, but sadly, that's incompatible with Nosferatu, which can't crit at all. And in the long term, Odin has something even better to build toward. Most first generation characters have classes exclusively from one faction or the other, depending on their origins. For example, Felicia's innate class sets are Troubadour and Mercenary, which are both Norian. But the three Awakening kids who show up in Conquest are different. They all start in Norian classes, but their Heartsteel classes are from Hoshido. Odin's alternate class is Samurai, reflecting his base class of Myrmidon and Awakening. And for him, Samurai access is a godsend. As a Samurai, Odin can learn Vantage, and that allows him to replicate Kilna's skill set to become an even better Nosferatu tank. Much later in the game, he can also get a skill from the Master of Arms promotion that increases his damage by 10. Combined with Vantage, that can make him strong enough to one-shot almost every enemy in the game before they can even attack. And that's with raw damage, no crits needed. We'll keep that idea in mind for later, but now let's examine our other recruit. Niles is an outlaw, a thief-type unit who wields a bow and can pick locks. Just by looking at his stats, you can see what Niles is meant to do. He's very fast, and he has a lot of resistance. He is specifically tuned to perform well in this, his introductory mission. His Iron Bow gives him 17 attack. Against the Dark Mages with their B rank and tomes, he faces a Weapon Triangle disadvantage that reduces his attack power by 1, so it's 16 attack versus their 5 defense. That's 11 damage, and 11 times 2 is 22, exactly enough to kill. Of course, because of that weapon triangle disadvantage, this kill calculation doesn't always work out in practice. He might miss. We had Silas bring a bronze bow for him partly to mitigate that problem, although the bronze bow doesn't have enough might for Niles to kill by himself. What's most interesting about Niles is his personal skill. We haven't built a prison yet, but once we do, Niles will be able to capture enemies when he defeats them in combat. After that, they'll appear in our castle, where we can persuade or bribe them to join the army. They then become fully playable. Most generic enemies can be captured, except for beasts, monsters, constructs, and illusions. We can also capture certain bosses, albeit not the ones who have a significant story presence. Most of the capturable bosses are found in paralogs. As a rule, the normal playable characters are going to have a higher performance ceiling than any capturable enemies, because those enemies have limited class sets and don't benefit from supports. However, in Conquest, on its higher difficulties, there are lots of generics who come with very useful skills, good stats, and high weapon ranks. You can capture some of those and plug them into your team very easily. And that means you don't have to focus too much on long-term team building plans if you don't want to. But this run is all about long-term team building, so I don't expect to use any captured enemies at all. Niles will join up with Odin, but before he does so, he can trade with Silas to take all the spare equipment that Silas has been carrying. He equips the bronze bow right away. It'll make his dual strikes more accurate. We stand together. Here, Odin takes the fire tome from Niles, but he doesn't equip it yet. It would have been possible for Silas to carry another tonic for Odin to use, and if he had, Odin could take that from Niles and use it right now. With Felicia around, he doesn't need one, so he just waits. Silas takes Niles and switches, then drops off to the right. None of the mages will be able to reach Silas from the shore.
as of now, their only available targets would be Niles and Odin. Odin has a lot less resistance than Niles does, and Odin can't kill them like Niles can. Let's do this! We've got this! Over here! Evil shall not prevail! Odin now benefits from both Lily's poise and Demoiselle, giving him a total of 12 effective resistance. That's enough for him to survive all three mages. Felicia's only six tiles away from the southwestern village, and that's exactly her movement range. So once we clear out the mages, she should be able to reach that village on turn three. You'll be all right. Odin and Niles have successfully set up some kills. The first is for Elise. You'd love to see that 35% defense growth go off. We're going to give Elise the Chapter 7 Silas treatment, building her axe rank by using her dual strikes as much as we possibly can. Next, Niles will kill the third mage using Arthur's dual strike. Unfortunately, we couldn't afford another bronze axe for Arthur, so we're going to use our second very dicey axe dual strike in as many attacks. It's safer if Niles uses his iron bow rather than counting on Arthur for this kill, but our support point counts in this battle are going to be very tight, so we need this dual strike to go off. If Arthur misses and Niles gets hit, that's very bad. Not bad, I guess. Hmm. Odin has a problem. Both of these fighters can kill him. However, they can only hit him from above, not from the sides. So all we have to do is put a wall in their way. Strength is everything! Finally, Silas carries Corrin all the way across the lake and into Flora's attack range. I'm here to help. Please, accept my help. Flora can help us out by attacking Corrin and thereby activating Valor Friendship.
That's a good start. All right, come Niles on. performs a solo attack against Flora. This sets up a kill for Arthur, and it also puts Niles in position to fight the mage approaching from the east. Elise switches Niles' weapons, then kills the fighter using Odin's dual strike. In two turns, a big crowd is going to pour out of the northern village. We want to pull this dark mage and this fighter away from that area so that we can deal with them separately from the crowd. As a first step in that process, Silas moves into the mage's range, luring him down to the southwest. Together we shall prevail. He equips his lance, gaining weapon triangle advantage against the mage to reduce the damage he takes. Arthur wants to continue progressing his support with Corrin. To do that, he must use Korn's dual strike as he defeats Flora. He can attack Flora from the west or from the south, but the west side is preferable. On the south side, Arthur would end his turn next to Niles, and then Niles would pick between Arthur's or Elise's dual strike at random. We want to make sure he uses Elise's support. Her bronze axe will be more accurate, and again, we want her to increase her axe rank ASAP. For Arthur to use Corrin's dual strike, Niles had to use his weaker bronze bow against Flora. But afterward, Elise switched into his iron bow so that he would be able to kill the incoming mage. Niles now has 14 listed attack. He loses 1 point due to weapon triangle disadvantage, but he gets it back from Lily's poise. 14 attack minus 5 defense is 9, so Niles will deal 18 damage. Elise's dual strike will deal 6 more. 18 minus 1 minus 5, all divided by 2. Assuming her attack connects, that'll be enough. Corn reaches the third village just in time. This looks dangerous because the Lancer can kill him. However, the Lancers are programmed to focus exclusively on running toward villages until they've all been visited. Because one of the villages is still open, this Lancer will not attack Corn yet. I believe in you. Silas rides north to pull the next fighter. He can do this while staying just barely outside of Kilma's range. Be careful! Let's 
chosen hero arrives! Odin's dual strike with Thunder is more reliable than Effie's, but Elise will only have a couple of opportunities to build support with Effie during this mission, so she needs to take those chances when she can. As with the Dark Mage and Fighter in the Northwest, we want to get these two mages out of the way before the reinforcements arrive. The big ice sculpture in the middle of the lake gives us a convenient way to do that. We can make the two mages go around opposite sides of it so that we can fight each of them separately. The right hand mage cannot reach the tile right above Elise. Meanwhile, the left hand one can't reach the space northeast of Elise. So if we put two units with ranged weapons on each of those tiles, we can battle both mages and each of our units will only take one attack. Oh, please. We've got this. This time, we purposely had Niles use his weaker bow so that he wouldn't kill with his counterattack here. We'd rather give this kill experience to Effie. bad that Silas dodged both enemy attacks over the last two turns. We'll talk about that later. Please. Having had another two turns to recover from the debuff inflicted by Flora's Steel Dagger, Korn can now survive an attack from the Lancer, even without any other defense bonuses. I'm here to help. I'll protect you. Elise uses Silas's support as she kills one of the mages. Had Korn's stats worked out a little differently, we might have had to position him one space farther east, where Lily's poise could save him from the Lancer, or we might have been forced to switch him with Silas. We want to start fighting the reinforcements by putting our units in positions where they can counterattack mages. So excited. Odin sets up first, using his vulnerary to restore his HP. That takes care of one mage, but we'd like to pull another, preferably in a way that splits up the six enemies who came out of that village. The second target is this mage, whom we can lure down the right-hand side of the sculpture. I won't let you down. There's just one issue with this tactic. That mage is going to bring one of his allies to support him with dual strikes. That ally might be his buddy right next to him, but it might equally be the mage standing next to the fighters in the northeast. The choice is completely random. We do not want to deal with random outcomes here. If this mage accompanies the highlighted guy, then the other one might also decide to go south, or he might head towards Odin, presenting Odin's team with an extra threat that they won't be able to handle. The solution is to prevent the eastern mage from providing any dual strike support by killing him. Once he's fully healed, Niles is capable of doing that. If this mage attacks Niles and dies, then the highlighted mage will always have to bring his buddy with him. 
Let's do this together. Disappointing. Now is when we wipe out as many of these enemies as we possibly can. I believe in you. Such are the whims of fate! I did it! Please, accept my help. This fighter has a lot of HP, but it's not enough to withstand the Silas Corrin combo. Forget this. Elise can kill a mage by herself. This is risky, but it also makes for a faster clear, because this positioning helps us engage the second lancer more quickly. Felicia can use either Silas or Elise for support here. Silas's dual strike is substantially safer, but we're going to be greedy and rely on Elise. That'll get Elise two points of axe experience. One now, and one more when Odin uses her dual strike to finish the fighter off. you down. We can do this together. <laughs> Knock it off. When's my turn? Never fear. Elise is absolutely killing it with these defense growths, but can I ask for a tiny bit more speed? And maybe strength? Mm. 
This is a good time to explain one of the few notable bugs in Fates. Odin has the Heartseeker skill, which reduces the avoid stat of adjacent enemies. This Lancer has 12 avoid, which gets reduced all the way to zero. Elise has 95 listed hit, she gets 5 additional hit due to the weapon triangle, and the enemy has zero avoid. That results in 100% accuracy, whether Elise is attacking this Lancer directly or contributing a dual strike against him. However, when Odin himself is the lead attacker, Elise's dual strikes do not have perfect accuracy. That's because whenever you select a unit in order to give commands to them, the game temporarily stops considering any aura skills that unit has when running calculations for their allies. So when Odin tries to attack an adjacent enemy on player phase, he himself sees the benefit of Heartseeker, but his teammates do not. On enemy phase, these effects worked just fine. Elise's accuracy was nearly perfect when she was dual striking on the counterattack a minute ago. And on player phase, the skills all apply properly whenever the unit in question is not selected. That's why Elise's hit rate is 100% when it's Felicia who is active. All aura skills work this way, not just Heartseeker. For example, when Elise attacks on player phase, a unit who is dual striking with her will not receive the damage bonus from Lily's poise. It's as if Lily's poise disappears entirely during Elise's player phase action, and then reappears once she is finished. We want to move Effie up north to engage the fighter there, and we want her to earn support points with Elise while she's at it. We can accomplish that goal with a transfer chain through Odin. I am Fate's accomplice! You, uh, passed your test! Too much power! We've got trouble! The two mages over here are linked, so they won't move until they both have a target in range. But we can pull the fighter separately. And that's a prime opportunity to put Korn and Arthur together for one more round of combat, which they'll need in order to earn the next point on their circuitous journey toward a sea support. It's team up time! Aside from Kilma, four enemies remain. We're going to feed three of these kills to Odin, that way we can get him to level 8, right on par with the rest of the squad. Meanwhile, Silas will ride toward the boss. He can reach Kilma in two turns. You are not alone! Ugh, my aching blood! Let's go! Here I am. Power overflowing! All three of these enemies can reach Odin now. He would be in a lot of danger if it weren't for the fact that he and Korn will fill up their guard gauge after the second attack, nullifying the third one. Arthur and Niles get out of the way. Effie can block the fighter's path toward Niles by moving down one space, and then Elise can safely wait above Effie. That will force the fighter to go for Odin. I'll protect you. My darkness was darker than yours! Let's go. We've got this. Can I help? Are you okay? 
Odin can't finish off either of these mages by himself, but Effie's dual strike is more than powerful enough to seal the deal. I'll do my best. <laughs> Let me at him. I have taught you well. Too much power. My hope was that Odin would have 11 magic by level 11. I am very pleased to be there already. Effie has to transfer Corrin to Silas, so that Silas will have the stats he needs to one round the boss. She can accomplish that indirectly through Felicia. What should we do? Here is where Silas's success at dodging attacks comes back to bite us. We really wanted Felicia to be able to heal Silas right now. Together with the one time that Felicia attacked while Silas was adjacent, that healing action would earn them a single support point. They got two in Chapter 7, so one more support point would qualify them for a C support. One of our other support goals is with Elise. She wants to get two points with Effie and one point with Arthur. She and Arthur have only fought together once, so Elise is actually fourth in Arthur's support count, after Niles, Corrin, and Effie. In order to make any progress on her Arthur support, Elise has to pass Effie and get into third place. So, when Elise kills this mage, she must use Arthur's dual strike, even though it's less accurate than Effie's. Let's make this fun. Together we we can go ahead and park Silas next to Kilma, and he'll be able to finish the mission on enemy phase. If we allow Kilma to attack first, the Nosferatu won't mitigate any of Silas's damage. But I'm okay with sacrificing a single meaningless turn to let Silas take some damage that Felicia can then heal. Again, the only thing this achieves is the Felicia Silas C support, and that's not important. We're not planning to have Silas marry Felicia or anything like that, but one turn is a very small price to pay for an extra support bonus that might come into play somewhere. Together we shall prevail. This talisman permanently increases a unit's resistance by two points. Resistance won't be very important for a while, so although I want to hang on to the talisman for later, I'm okay with selling it if we have to. All right. You know it. You. Yes. Yeah. Is that so?
Yes. Thank you. Um... No. Yes. <laughs> no. Thank you. Yes. Ah, oh, yeah. Huh? Huh? Thank you very much. I am fully aware that the idea of non-lethally subduing an armed resistance by using swords and bows and the like makes no sense whatsoever. However, I kind of like the way it happens in this chapter. The story is about you persuading villagers that you don't want to harm them, and that's something you actually get to do in gameplay. The combat that happens is mainly a conceit to make the gameplay more interesting. Anyway, we've succeeded in our mission. Now we have to march back to Castle Krakenberg to report our success to King Garen and receive another assignment. See you next time.